Welcome to another episode of the Ask a CISO podcast, powered by Harangi, Asia's leader in cloud security. Every episode, you get insider tips and insights into current challenges and newest trends in cybersecurity from the world's best experts to help level up your cybersecurity career. Here's your host, Paul Hadji, to introduce today's guest. Hello out there, and welcome again to another episode of Ask a CISO podcast, brought to you by Harangi Cybersecurity. I am your host for today, Mark Fuentes. I'm the Director of Cyber Operations at Harangi Cybersecurity. And today I have with me a really interesting guest who works out of Singapore as well. His name is John Lee. He's the Managing Director at Global Resilience Federation Asia Pacific. It's a nonprofit provider and hub for cyber, supply chain, physical, and geopolitical threat intel exchange between information sharing and analysis centers and organizations, as well as certs in various sectors around the world. Uh, John is also the managing director for Asia Pacific for OT ISAC and the president of Singapore's chapter of Project Management Institute, which are both huge organizations, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. He has more than 20 years of experience in information security, OT cybersecurity, project management, governance, risk management, and operations. And he's led many cross-cultural teams in Asia Pacific and Middle East that successfully executed business transformation projects and managed global services in InfoSec, infrastructure, and integration. Formerly, John was also the president of ISAC of Singapore, and he's spoken at cybersecurity conferences like RSA, Black Hat, IMDC Asia, Cloud Security Asia, GovWare, Interpol World, and a lot others. Great, great resume, John. Welcome. Welcome to the... Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you as well. There's a lot that we can really pick your brain about, and I'm sure as everyone can see from your bio. But one thing I really wanted to talk about today, just to kick it off, was I wanted to talk about Global Resilience Federation Asia Pacific and the kind of work that you guys are doing over there. Maybe you can give our listeners a quick rundown of what's going on over there. Sure. I mean, it's a pleasure to be here. And well, I'm working for Global Resilience Federation, and I think a lot of people may not have heard of it before. I joined Global Resilience Federation in 2019. That was when I was recruited to start the first information sharing analysis center for operational technology in Singapore. So many of us have heard of the Financial Services Information Sharing Analysis Center, or FSI, SEC, especially if you're in the, yeah, see, especially if you're in the banking and the financial institutions and the insurance industry, you are part of the ISEC. And if you are in a healthcare, then you probably have heard of the HISEC, healthcare ISEC. That's right. And uh, OTISEC, it's formed out of a need uh, along the lines of uh, financial industries and uh, healthcare to share information because uh, sharing information is actually a very low-hanging fruit. We help each other to be more resilient, you know, to get early warnings. And uh, GRF was actually set up uh, out of uh, the financial services uh, ISAC back then. In the late 1990s, we just had the financial services ISAC set up in the USA. And over the course of the decades, uh, the last two decades, there were a lot of demand for ISACs that are sector-specific, not only financial uh, institutions. So we have the water ISAC, the energy ISAC, the healthcare ISAC, and there was no ISAC that caters for operational technology. So in 2019, back then, the CEO from FSISAC came to Singapore in 2017, and there was interest to set up an ISAC in Singapore that caters for the operational technology, especially supporting the critical information infrastructure. As you know, that if the, they are impacted, if there's no lights or water, it's not just only that your household, but it's in fact the whole of economy and the community will be impacted. So Global Resilience Federation is actually a collection of ISACs. I, Use the word loosely because we are non-profit organizations and we collaborate. So we don't really, we have a very loose way of collaboration, meaning there are no hard lines, mainly soft lines where we don't really report into, you know, one central organizations. So you can, you can view it as a network, like a cell approach where, you know, everyone is contributing to the community to be cyber resilient and also in a circle of trust. So Global Resilience Federation was set up in around 2017, you know, spun off from the FSI site and it formally became a entity within the uh, supporting the collaboration among the ISACs. 
So within that, there are about 17 ISACs, out, out of which OT ISAC, Operational Technology ISAC, is one of them. You know, I think this is something that's super, super understated when it comes to defending ourselves, right, against cybercrime. And I always remember when I'm, I'm from America and then when 9-11 happened, I was in high school, but I remember that after 9-11, one of the biggest things that we learned was that things like that are able to happen when information is compartmentalized and it's not shared across various interested parties. And so as I grew up and I grew up in the cyber field and information security, one thing I noticed was a lot of people like to hoard knowledge and hoard information. Or even when you see an organization gets breached or or they get attacked, they like to hold off on disclosing vulnerabilities or things that they found, exploits that they found inside their organizations. What are the things that organizations like OTISAC are doing to encourage that sharing of information between share, uh, interested parties? Yeah, for one, we operate in a circle of trust. So we are membership uh, driven. So on the one side, there are member communities, companies, uh, organizations that belong to critical information infrastructure and also the non-critical information infrastructure. So these are your OT asset owners and operators your power plant, your water utilities, your healthcare, your supply chain distribution companies, your manufacturing companies, and land transport, aviation, and marine time as well, and emergency services. So we operate in a circle of trust, and we realize that, I think you're right, people like to hold off on information sharing because yeah. I think, number one, there's confidentiality reasons because you don't want to disclose about the incident that has happened. Sure. Uh, or any vulnerabilities of your products to the public till you have actually fixed it. And certainly you don't want to report of any hacking incidents within your company. So we help them by anonymizing the threat indicators or the information so that there's no attribution. What I mean by attribution is that you could not even uh, attribute it to a single company. So mm -hmm. we are just uh, uh, reporting on the uh, incident itself, the threat uh, itself to help other uh, organizations to stay safe. So for example, if there's an aviation incident and if the attribution is not possible, meaning that from the threat itself, you can infer that a certain entity or whether it's airport that has been a breach, then probably that is not anonymized. That information should not be shared because it can lead to attribution. So we have uh, on one side, the member who is sharing information and on the other side, our partners who are providing information. Our partners are subject matter experts that have a very deep and wide knowledge about the verticals, whether it's aviation, whether it's healthcare, whether it's marine time. So we sit in the middle, we are like a hub and spoke. So we encourage information sharing between the two parties. And um, across, we have certain protocols. We call it the traffic light protocol, whereby information is shared according to that protocol. So and if you really want to maintain a confidentiality, that's TLP rate. Many two parties share information, with, whether it's two members or partner and member, and that information cannot be shared outside of that sharing. In, in cannot be shared within with your organization as well. Then we have a TLP Ember where information is shared between two parties can be shared with members of the recipients uh, organizations, so that you can use it to help your organizations to stay safe and secure. Then we have TLP Green where information is shared, can be shared with the OTISAC uh, community. And then TLP-wide is open source uh, intelligence. I see, I see. I always wondered, I mean, I have run across the Intel before and I've seen the labels, but I guess I never really put much thought into, okay, what does TLP green mean? What does TLP white mean? That gives me a little bit of, you know, you learn something new every day. Yeah, Mark, <laughs> in this line, you're always learning because uh, you can never say that you know everything about cyber security, cyber threats, it's or even too vast. A, a vertical. It's too vast, yeah. right? It's definitely too vast. So what you're saying, so with Global Resilience Federation, a lot of the work that you do is facilitating the sharing between different ISACs, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say that Global Resilience Federation didn't exist how would any of that sharing happen between an FSI SAC and an OTI SAC? Well, Global Resilience Federation was created out of a need to provide a support to the ISACs, but the ISACs has been around since the late 1990s. And so we recognize that there's economy of scale 
if you have an organization like Global Resilience Federation, so that you need not replicate most of the best practices across the ISEC, because the ISECs do come up with good stuff like Health ISEC or FS ISEC. And so we want to learn from the ISECs in supporting the members' organizations within our own specific ISEC. So the cross-sector sharing within Global Resilience Federation and the centralized support that Global Resilience Federation provides in some areas will help the ISECs to concentrate on their mission, which is to ensure the able resilience of the sector that they support. So I, I would say that it is actually essential to have an organization, but to oversee, to support, not to oversee. As I said, it's not a hard line, but it's a soft line. So, I mean, all of the sharing that we're talking about, we're actually talking about probably a lot of threat intel and just intel on vulnerabilities, exploits, et cetera, right? But I'm sure that these ISACs also come up with really great best practices, really great standards. Does that come into play at all with Global Resilience Federation? Do you guys publish any best practices or, or work with any other you know, how external standards organizations or, or like that, anything like that? Yeah, we created a business resiliency council that uh, were looking after the standards uh, operational resilience uh, framework. So in, in there, it actually uh, uses certain standards like the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework uh, mm -hmm. and other standards like ISA 62443, uh, depending on the needs of the particular community so that we can actually help the community organizations in that community to be more cyber resilient. And that operational resilience framework is a guide to organizations because we know that the risk is probably not, it's a business risk and an operational risk. And cybersecurity is an operational risk. Yep. So it is needed to have very robust or healthy or holistic outlook view. So we start from the top, meaning that you need to have a cyber risk management, a cybersecurity framework and mm -hmm. an operational resilience framework so that you can actually take the steps when the incident happens. Of course, following the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, you would put in steps to identify the threats if you can, and next to protect it after you identify as well as to detect. So in case you cannot do it, you need to respond and recover. And and, and so it's, it's more of a holistic uh, framework. Uh, it's not just uh, specifically to any uh, systems or equipment, but any framework is generic. So the beauty of the framework is that it allows you to use it to contextualize it to your environment. So if you are a port, if you're a hospital, if you are a healthcare manufacturer, so you have to contextualize that framework uh, to your environment. All right. So I noticed there when you were listing it out, you listed out identify, detect, respond and recover, right? And a lot of times, and this is just a personal thing, when I talk to a lot of people about resilience, right, actual resilience, just personally, I've kind of already, almost already abandoned the prevention part, the prevent. Did you leave out the prevent on purpose or was that just, you forgot to put it on the list or I was just wondering if you, if someone else was along the same thinking as myself. Yeah. Yes, I think prevention is always there. So I mentioned protect. So prevention is under the protect pillar. But however, you're right because um, you have heard that some professionals say uh, assume breach. Man, assume breach. You will be yeah. breached. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but my, my take on it is that you have to do your due diligence. So you can't assume that you'll be breached and then just prepare to respond. So you need to take some steps to protect and detect the threats uh, so that... Out of a 1,000 maybe uh, threats uh, that can actually flow through your networks, so maybe you have maybe 10 of that only active threats uh, because you have blocked the 999 threats, right, uh, right. Nine, 990 threats. Uh. So I, I guess it's across the five pillars. So that new cybersecurity framework, I think it's a framework. Yep. Okay, but yep. we have to use it and we have to use it effectively and efficiently within our own organizations. Yeah, I think that's the key word. I think Efficiently is the key word. I think strategically is the key word. Like when I started in the industry, I think a lot of a lot of cybersecurity dollars get spent on prevent or on protect on the protect pillar. I think we're starting to move into the more respond and recover pillars in this day and age. And I think the people who are a little bit more new to the game, they try to say, "Hey, we want to prevent it before it starts," right? But seasoned folks like you and I are always like, 
We, the word is resilience, actually. The word is resilience. The word is to be able to withstand the attack and keep going, right? Keep operations up and, and running. What would you say are the, if you had like a top three things for people to focus on when they want to worry about resilience, what's, what's the top three things? Like, yeah, there are many, but I can just list the three of the top of my head. I think you need to know your basically your environment or your assets because uh, you need to know what you're protecting. Yep. What is of value to you? What do you want to protect? And part of it is about aligning to your business requirements or business strategy because the business uses the assets for their operations to achieve their business strategy. So you need to understand what is important for the business, which mm-hmm. asset are key so that it provides the continuity, business continuity for the business and they should be protected first. So you're knowing what you need to protect. Secondly, how are the assets connected, the architecture? So I use the word security architecture because that is also part of security engineering. How do you actually do the integration connectivity? How does data flow from one mm-hmm. to the other? That you have a picture, right? If you are trying to protect your your power station, which is your critical assets, uh, that you know that uh, what are the inputs, outputs, and within there, what are the people, process, technology you need to protect? What are the controls? Do you use third party? So the architecture, security architecture, which includes knowing your risks in the supply chain, your internal risks, mm-hmm. your equipment risks, uh, vulnerabilities you mentioned, and also your insider threats. Thirdly, it's having a roadmap because you cannot protect everything. That's right. So you know your assets, your critical assets uh, that are important for your business. You know how these assets are connected. But what do you really want to do? You mentioned strategy, strategic. So what do you really want to do in the short term, which is tactical or operational, and then in the mid to long term, which is strategic. So then you have a roadmap. Then you can prioritize it. But of course, easier said than done. There are a lot of challenges. If you talk to 10 different people, they have different ideas. But for me personally, because I I come from a, a practitioner background, uh, mm-hmm. so I was working for uh, engineering companies and the maritime companies uh, doing security operations, information security policies, uh, governance, risk compliance, and information technology as well, applications. So the need to actually know what you want to protect and align it to your business uh, stakeholders are important. So I mentioned aligning to your business strategy, your objectives, and then knowing what you have, uh, your current stage, uh, which is your security infrastructure. So you are here, but really, do you want to move from here in the maturity model to here? Yeah. Uh, then that's important. But then the gap is where you have the third, thirdly, the roadmap. Now, how do you, because you need to spend dollars, you need to invest yes. uh, money, you need to invest time, you need to invest. You, you, you need to do it capital. smartly because, you know, it's a finite resource, right? We have finite resources. And, you know, you picked the top three right out of my brain as well. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, I think they say great minds think alike. Yeah, yeah, you picked it right out of my brain. What I like to tell a lot of my clients when I'm consulting is that let's just say that you got breached today, right? You're in this bad spot and, you know, your CEO puts you in front of all the press and they're all, you know, everyone's going to ask you three main questions, right? The, the first question they're going to ask is what assets are involved? What data is involved? What parts of your infrastructure are involved? in this in this incident the second thing that they're going to want to know is do you know what the risk is involved with those assets that are involved and the third is do you have a plan do you have a strategy right and i tell people okay when you start building your capabilities these three capabilities are the first ones you want to build is finding your your assets and your data and your data flows and identifying your risk and then coming up with a strategy for when things go bad right? right So I picked it right out of my brain. So that was very, very exciting for me to hear. Um, So you seem to, you know, you're you're very seasoned. You've been doing this for some time. How do we get to, you know, I think when I go out to a lot of my clients, a lot of the organizations I see, when you talk about maturity, right, they're basically at this stage where they have maybe some stuff, but it's not very standardized. But everybody wants to get to this ideal state where they're this, they're optimized, like in CMMI, they're optimized. They're using data to, to feed back into their, their controls. How far away do you think we are from that, from the majority of our companies getting 
organizations getting to that kind of maturity. Is that something that we're going to see in the next five years or 10 years? What do you think? A lot of organizations do not even know what where they are, their current state. I think the first step is to look at really where you are and then base your projections into where you want to be based on your business growth, business objectives, because your business uses assets that are connected and there are risks involved in the interdependency or interconnection of these, these assets. And we really need to look at the areas where the threats to those assets, looking at the, just not the threats, but also the vulnerabilities. So we need to protect the assets from being breached. And a lot of it starts uh, from having a good uh, security uh, roadmap or security uh, program. That involves a good uh, cyber governance, cyber security governance, because to actually put in place a roadmap, you need to know what you want to achieve. And that organization uh, is important. So you have a organization where people are accountable and, uh, and responsible. And also uh, then they go out to actually secure those assets. So you have probably heard that a lot of the uh, critical information infrastructure, they hold their top guy responsible and accountable for yep. any breaches. And that's probably right, but it's not a good place to be, especially if you are leading a company and you do not know anything about what is being connected. It's like terrifying, uh, but, actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, right, right. it's, it's like fighting with some unknown and that unknown is like, you know, when will it hit you? Yeah. So, but, uh, all is not lost because there are things that you can do to reduce the risk. To do, for example, cyber hygiene and all that's uh, actually one of the top areas where you can actually beef up. And we know that in operational technology, safety has been the greatest concern because the numbers of accidents happening at the worksite. So right. nowadays, I think the incidents have been reduced because our need of awareness that you need to actually have considered safety. You are actually in manufacturing or your operations. Now, cybersecurity is something that people do not understand because they may think that it's just an IT thing. It's an IT problem, uh, so let the IT resolve it. And IT would think that an operation problem, I don't understand the operations. I don't understand the engineering. So I don't, I would just buy probably systems uh, and then that's it. Yeah. You know, I, hopefully that I, we will not be breached. So a lot of this starts from the top. The tone from the top is important. So I'm borrowing some of the terminology uh, no, no, that I use the work with, right? So I think, so making, making the chief executive accountable, the chief executive will be part of the conversations on how to secure the assets or the company operations, uh, meaning that there are communications uh, top down and bottom up. So you really would consider all the risk scenarios that can happen because IT by itself or OT by itself, they are not really connected to the uh, senior management or the strategy. So you need to cascade down using a top-down threat or risk uh, scenarios. And then you need to get the bottom up as well because you need to have the buy-in from the operations, the people that are doing it, and from the mid-level, the uh, supporting uh, functions. Yeah, I think what's key there is to get that buy-in, executive buy-in, to get that top-down approach. I think where we've always been... I think historically, a lot of us, like you said, a lot of us come from the practical side of things, right? So I myself was a network engineer, you know, all of us are quite technical and we had to learn their language is what we had to do, right? And that's why I think the the thing that we've been running into for years and years and years and trying to get that top down approach is that we are trying to get them to understand cybersecurity on our terms. And I think the key to getting that top down approach is to put it from their perspective and speak to their language, which is quite a challenge for a lot of us because we're coming from that technical side. And then now we have to learn that business language and what's important to the business. So I think we're starting to shift into that side, but I think it's still a long road to get to that understanding between the two sides. Right. It's definitely a continuous journey. And I think organization needs to be proactive to drive it from the top and from the bottom. So that awareness of risk needs to pervade through the whole entire uh, organization's management. I think they are busy, like the CEO, the C-suites are uh, in growing the business. So the bottom and the middle layer also needs to highlight the risk of certain key areas where they can bring it up to the conversations with the top management. And there must be a willingness to collaborate between all levels of the organizations. So it's not just like, working on my area and I'm doing well. I meet all the KPIs. There's no risk, so I'm okay. Yeah. So, 
So we I, need to I've be, done my part, right? Right. We need to be working to figure out how we can turn our part of the business into a business driver as well. I think that's where we will get a little bit more appreciation from the top. Right. A key thing in my job in running the Operational Technology Information Sharing Analysis Center is to build a community of like-minded cybersecurity professionals. So I talk to a lot of people, member organizations, as well as the public, and I foster collaboration with organizations, whether it's the equipment manufacturers or standards or the government agencies or even the certs. And also, most importantly, with the member organizations, because they do have a, a depth of uh, subject matter expertise, which I can tap on to help other member organizations. So we organize events where we bring members together in a closed community. Sometimes it's a closed door. And we get the members to talk to each other, to share best practices, to say, for example, one member has a fusion center, you know, then how does that help? The, what is What exactly is the fusion center? How does the concept helps other member organizations? Mm. So as you see that I'm pretty excited uh, in uh, what I'm doing oh, because yeah. I don't really get to do this when I'm working for organizations. You always have to follow the policies, the uh, KPIs that uh, you, is set for you and also the roadmap. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So essentially you're dealing in threat intelligence, right? Um, and you're dealing here in this region. I've been here some time, but I'm still quite new to this region. I'm coming from the West. And the problem that I found coming out here and trying to ingest threat intelligence is a lot of it t- tends to be Western centric or American centric, right? And I've been lamenting the lack of more ASEAN based threat, threat intel feeds. Is there any work that you're doing at the Global Re- Resilience Federation to produce such a feed that would be more useful for organizations in this region? We are talking to a lot of organizations like the CERTs. So the CERTs will see things, uh, incidents in their countries like uh, in ASEAN. And so probably they can give us some information and we can further enrich the information through research, working with our partners in certain areas to get more information about the event or the threat or the incident to fine-tune the intelligence so that we can reshare it back uh, to the community. And uh, it's been, as you said at the start, that nobody wants to share. Yeah, uh, I right. Think. So it's security through obscurity. I think it's a thing of the past. And uh, in this, I think, uh, says that, uh, you know, it's gone. There's no longer security through obscurity. Uh, so you need to actually share. And it's not a matter of how you do it, you know, the template itself, but it's the contextualization. So you can have a security by not sharing that information that is pertinent to your organizations. But how do you set up the security operations center? I think that those are based on best practices. Yeah, most definitely. And I think you're exactly right. I think security through obscurity and acting as lone operators here and in the wild, it's just not working anymore because we're all watching the adversary evolve. And the adversary is sharing knowledge as well, right? And it's getting harder to fight. And I think the best way forward is together. And I think this is something that's quite understated in our industry. I think I think not a lot of people are talking about information sharing. I think ISACs, ISAC should be more prominent than they are today. So it's a lot, it's very important work that you guys are doing to raise that kind of awareness. How about, you said it's membership, right? For all about membership. Is it? A strenuous process to gain membership into an ISAC? Well, there's a vetting process where you need to qualify, uh, meaning that you must belong to that particular sectors. Uh, for example, health ISAC, you need to be in healthcare. So for operational technology ISAC, as long as you are op- operational uh, OT, asset owners and operators, then you can actually be part of the ISAC. And uh, number one, number two, you must have a legitimate uh, business so we do some uh, business check. I mean, it's easy enough to do these days from the public uh, domain. So, and if your company is not known or not registered, then probably we should not actually uh, accept uh, because it may be a, a front for some sure. like, other malicious activities. Uh, so- it's not a very strenuous process, but once they are in, I think it's when they're onboarded, it's coming out of activities, you know, to engage them, to, to make them see the value of the information sharing, not just by consumption, but by sharing. But so we do have two bottles, well. yeah, contributing yeah. and also interaction uh, with members through the forums, the closed door discussions. 
so that we can help other members and help ourselves as well, themselves, to further the uh, cybersecurity resilience for the organizations. So we do training workshops to raise the awareness of the member organizations. So we bring in subject matter experts, uh, trainers. Sometimes they provide, you know, as uh, part of their service. Uh, sometimes it's a paying workshop, right? Uh, so, but of course, uh, through the ISEX, probably we will get uh, better rates uh, than if they were to get it from the uh, trainers. And uh, best practices like uh, threat modeling, uh, risk assessments, uh, we do all that as well. Uh, but of course, we don't do that uh, in a commercial way. So we do that uh, mainly as a uh, practitioner. We get uh, subject matter experts. We facilitate the conversations or the activities uh, between the member organizations and the uh, volunteers. That's pretty cool, actually. My next question actually is, it's quite self-serving. It's quite a self-serving question. So around you, we're, we're a consulting company. We're, we're a cybersecurity co- company, but we're... Again, on the outside, we're not probably able to gain membership into an ISAC, right? Is there a way that we can play with you guys? Is there a way that we can get some of that, you know, sweet, sweet, right? Into- action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Part of the action. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there a way that organizations like mine can be involved or that can share in, in the threat intelligence? Yeah, sure. I think we do. If you look at on our portal, uh, we do uh, partnerships with uh, OT, cybersecurity vendors or solution providers, the original equipment manufacturers, mm-hmm. the, the certs and the agencies as well. Uh, so we believe that there's no one source of truth. You know, in order to verify intelligence, probably you need to speak to two or three, look at two or three sources so that you can right. form a triangulation. Right. But of course, we value the subject matter expertise of our partners, companies like Orangey that can provide a lot of insights uh, to our members and our partners. They share out of a passion to contribute, you know, to increase yeah. the cyber resilience and, of course, to uh, put themselves uh, as a subject matter experts and indirectly uh, to say that, uh, okay, they are the subject matter experts and we provide the, the portal. And no one knows everything. So it's through the uh, collaboration with the partners. I think we get better intelligence because it's not a one way. No. Uh, so there's, you know, going back to partners or going back to the members. Because if intelligence is just a single direction or bi-direction, I think there are a lot of things that are missing in there right. uh, that we could probably tap on the conversation if it's uh, bi-directional and it's flowing bi-directional. Uh, of course, in the circle of trust, right? Uh, so, yeah. Certainly, yeah, we like to have that conversation uh, with Oranji. Oh, man, definitely. I think that's probably what, what we're going to do right after, right? So I'll uh, try and get involved in that stuff because it's, it's actually something I noticed, like I said, when I came out here, I was really looking, I th- I really felt that a lot of the value would be with the sharing of this kind of information, with the production of threat intelligence that's more specific to here and wh- where we do business and what's important to our geolocation. Yeah, so kind of coming up at the 40 minute mark, which is kind of where I like to have it. So maybe just one last thing from you, John, if you were to leave our our listeners with one very important takeaway for today, what would it be? I think off the top of my mind, I think you really need to get going, meaning that I've heard this term before, call to action. So regardless of your level of cybersecurity, you need to take the first step and coming up with that first step and that program, right? Top down or, or middle up or bottom up. So uh, generally, you need to have a sense of what you want to achieve in terms of cyber resilience and then tie it to your business objectives because cyber resilience is not just about protecting your assets from being breached, but it's about enabling your business to continue operations. That's right. uh, Even through the bad times when you are down with an incident. So it's a cyber, you know, it's, it's more than that. It's a business enabler. So cybersecurity is a base business enabler and it must be part of the whole thought process or consideration by the top management that they need to have this as one of the components. There are many areas. So I mentioned safety as mm-hmm. one of them and innovation, digitalization, cybersecurity. So take all these and put it together in the puzzle, right? And talk to experts like you and me. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. they can say that. No, I, I, I think I, I can't say that because I'm always learning, as I said in the beginning. It doesn't mean you're not an expert, John. It doesn't mean you're not an expert. I think we're all lifelong learners, but you're definitely... Lifelong learners. Yeah, you're definitely an expert in my book. But there you have it, folks. The journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. 
and John is telling you to take that first step. Well said. Uh, Thank was, you, everyone. Thank was, you, Mark. Yeah, it was I such mean, a pleasure having you, John. Thank you so much. You definitely have a wealth of information that we can all enjoy. So uh, everyone check out John. You can find out more about him at Global Resilience Federation Asia Pacific. Thank you again, John. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, audience. Thank you, everyone. Have all a right. great day. Everyone else out there, you guys can check us on the next one. Thank you. Thank you.